It's also a very good day because given the spectacular speech of uh, the President of France, I think we are on the verge of a renaissance of Franco-American relations of unprecedented proportions, which uh, augurs well for Europe, the United States, and the stability of the entire world. Today's hearing could not be more timely. A few weeks ago, when I called this hearing, we planned to deal with the state of political affairs in Pakistan and how the United States could best help provide stability and security in the region. Deputy Secretary of State John Negroponte was invited to testify on the situation of terrorist elements finding sanctuary in the border areas of Pakistan. We ask that he analyze the effectiveness of current U.S. foreign policy toward Pakistan. We also requested the Secretary to give us his assessment of the strength of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and other terrorist organizations. We suggested that he offer an evaluation of the current political leadership in Pakistan. <clears throat> Secretary Negroponte, we were quite pleased that you accepted our invitation to testify back then. And given what has happened since Saturday, we are delighted that you didn't break our date. No doubt your prepared testimony has evolved over the last few days. From the perspective of the United States, what happens in Pakistan is of tremendous importance. The political crisis there has broad implications for our country, for Afghanistan, and for all the nations in the region. Today we will address some of those concerns. Because I believe we need to have a serious dialogue between the administration and members of this committee, we will just have very brief opening statements from the chair and ranking members of the full committee and the subcommittee on the Middle East and South Asia. As a last word, I just wanted to note that President Musharraf has reached out to officials in our government, both in the administration and in the Congress. He placed a call to me just yesterday, and I find it noteworthy that in this time of crisis, is seeking a dialogue with both the administration and the Congress. I now turn to my esteemed colleague and friend, the ranking member of the committee, Ms. Ileana ross Layton, and for any remarks she would like to make. Thank you, as always, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, join you in welcoming our distinguished uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, to our committee. General Musharraf's recent actions are deplorable. His express commitments have proven to be only empty promises. He has betrayed the trust of the United States and, more importantly, of the Pakistani people. He suspended the Constitution and dismissed most of the Supreme Court judge judges. This, in addition to the arrest of over 500 lawyers, opposition politicians, and human rights activists, can only be described as a devastating blow to Pakistani democracy. New restrictions have also been placed on the print and broadcast media. By, pa by taking Pakistan off the path toward democracy and civil rule, General Musharraf has further jeopardized social stability, not enhanced it. This is what Asma Jahangir had to say about the current situation in Pakistan. She's a former Time Magazine Asian hero, a member of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, and a former special rapporteur of the UN Commission of Human Rights. She says, the president said he had to clamp down on the press and the judiciary to curb terrorism. Those he has arrested are progressive, secular-minded people, while the terrorists are offered negotiations and ceasefires. In light of the anti-military coup restrictions contained in U.S. law, 
it would be appropriate for the administration to place our security assistance programs to Pakistan under review. Yet it would be counterproductive to suspend assistance that directly benefits the Pakistani people or which supports counterterrorism cooperation against Al Qaeda and other extremist elements. Al Qaeda and other extremists are launching increasingly bold attacks against the Pakistani state and society. They seek to destabilize Islamabad and use Pakistan as a base of operations to strike the United States and the West. It remains, as the chairman has said, in our nation's long-term interest to forge an enduring strategic partnership with a democratic, stable, and prosperous Pakistan that remains a strong partner in the campaign against Islamic militants and which maintains responsible controls over its nuclear weapons capability. What happens in Pakistan has implications for our homeland security, and I'm particularly grateful that Ambassador Negroponte, given his previous role as Director of National Intelligence, is appearing before us today to share his insight and discuss options for the United States and our allies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's be clear at the outset. What the world has witnessed since General Musharraf declared emergency rule last Saturday is most emphatically not about fighting terrorism. It most certainly is about General Musharraf keeping his job, or should I say, both jobs. The pictures from Islamabad don't show any al-Qaeda or Taliban terrorists being arrested, but they do show all too vividly a brutal attack, a, brut a brutal crackdown on opposition politicians, lawyers, and human rights activists. Press reports don't tell us the Pakistani army is tracking down al-Qaeda or Taliban terrorists along the border with Afghanistan, but they do tell us of the removal of seven Supreme Court justices, the closure of the independent media outlets, the suspension of the Constitution, and the postponement of January's parliamentary elections. Ever since 9-11, the Bush administration has ignored democratic development in Pakistan and turned a blind eye as General Musharraf manipulated the political process to ensure his continued terror in office. He has made and then broken repeated promises to step down as army chief and to restore legitimate civilian democratic government to Pakistan. And at every turn, the Bush administration has given him a pass, even on the subject of nuclear proliferation and the potential that nuclear weapons would fall into the hands of terrorists, the danger described by this administration as the most serious threat facing the United States. President Bush is willing to take Musharraf at his word when he says the AQ Khan network has been rolled up and is not a threat anymore. The administration has accepted all of this in the name of Musharraf's commitment to fighting terrorism, a commitment which, in my view, has always been half-hearted at best. Always focused on al-Qaeda, but not on the Taliban. Always willing to arrest high-profile al-Qaeda operatives just at the right moment, but let the Taliban move freely back and forth across the border with Afghanistan, and never quite willing to give up the idea that someday the Taliban would be useful to him in countering Indian or Iranian influence in the region. And when the Bush administration welcomed Musharraf's verbal expressions of support in the fight against terror, it never pushed him to develop support for his, for his fight amongst his own people. So when it came time to confront al-Qaeda in the tribal areas, Musharraf had no political support and, and to do so and instead made deals with al-Qaeda supporter in North and South Waziristan. These deals are a disaster and only serve to strengthen our enemies. We now have the worst of all possible worlds. Our ally is an isolated and deeply resented leader who is less popular with his own people than is Osama bin Laden, who instead of arresting the terrorists who pose a, an, external, an existential threat to his regime, if not the country, is arresting the very people with whom he could have worked to generate the political support necessary to rid Pakistan of extremists. Ten billion dollars worth of U.S. assistance since 9-11, and our great and good ally in the war on terror, told us to go take a hike again last weekend while he imposed martial law. But this time, Mr. Chairman, we should not turn the other proverbial cheek. This time, there should be consequences. We should stop delivery of any further F-16s to Pakistan and cut off all further other U.S. assistance until the state of emergency is lifted, the Constitution is restored, the fired Supreme Court justices are reinstated, opposition politicians and civil society uh, activists are released, independent media is allowed to reopen, a caretaker government is appointed to hold free and p fair parliamentary elections, and General Musharraf steps down as promised as Chief of the Army Staff. 
It's time, Mr. Chairman, for the United States to have a relationship with the people of Pakistan, not just its military and certainly not just General Musharraf. Thank you very much. The chair will be ready to recognize Mr. Pence of Indiana, and will do so when he arrives. It is a pleasure to have with us today one of this nation's most experienced and accomplished diplomats. Ambassador John Negroponte began his service to our country in 1960, when he became a Foreign Service officer. Between then and 1997, when he left the Foreign Service, he held three ambassadorships to Mexico, Honduras, and the Philippines. Between 2001 and 2004, Ambassador Negroponte served as our permanent representative to the United Nations, a position he relinquished in order to become ambassador to Iraq. After serving as our first director of national intelligence, he took up his current assignment as deputy secretary of state. Ambassador Negroponte is a graduate of Yale. He speaks five languages and is a most distinguished member of our foreign policy establishment. We are delighted to have you, Mr. Ambassador. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Ross Leighton, other members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I have submitted a statement for the record which has been uh, circulated, I believe. And, Without uh, objection, it will be entered in the record. This is a uh, summary version of those remarks. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today to discuss our relationship with Pakistan. Pakistan is a country vital to our interests. Its cooperation is critical to, to our and NATO's cause in Afghanistan, and it is contributing heavily to our efforts in the war on terror. Pakistan is a country founded with a democratic mandate that has made fitful progress toward the ideal of democratic civilian rule. Until recently, Pakistan seemed to be on a path toward civilian democratic rule. We strongly counseled against emergency rule, but Pakistan's leadership did not follow our advice. Over time, we have had a tumultuous relationship with Pakistan marked by many ups and downs. After 9-11, President Musharraf made the strategic decision to partner with us. We are together with the Pakistani government and people in resisting al-Qaeda and the Taliban and in creating a more prosperous, democratic, and stable Pakistan. The witness will suspend. Any hand signals will result in the individuals being ejected from the room. The wearing of hats is not allowed in a committee hearing. You will remove your hat or you will be ejected from the room. Yes. Right. Remove this man from the room. This is a committee hearing and the quorum will be maintained. Please resume, Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. Many Pakistanis say the United States has not been a consistent partner over the years, but there is no question that we Americans have a stake in Pakistan. And I think there's nothing more important at this time than for the United States to be closely engaged and committed to helping the Pakistani people fight violent extremism and create a more stable and democratic Pakistan. I hope at the same time that the Pakistani people understand that we strongly disagree with their government right now about its recent decisions and about the right way to build a democratic state. But that disagreement should not translate 
into disengagement. As President Bush said on Monday, November 5th, President Musharraf's new emergency powers undermine democracy. President Bush called on President Musharraf to restore demo democracy quickly, to ensure that elections take place as scheduled, and to resign his position as Chief of, of Army Staff, as he had promised to do. But the President also pointed out that President Musharraf has been an indispensable ally in the global war on terrorism, a leader who extremists and radicals have tried to assassinate multiple times. Since 9-11, Pakistan's government and security forces have captured or killed more al-Qaeda operatives and Taliban militants than any other country. Under President Musharraf's leadership, Pakistan became a more moderate and prosperous country. Due to sound economic policies, Pakistan has enjoyed an average 7 percent economic growth rate since 2001. The events of recent days notwithstanding, civil society and media groups have also strengthened under the present government. A rapid increase in television and internet media outlets has helped spark a broader and more participatory national debate about the direction of the country, and human rights and other civil society groups play a more influential role in the political process than they have in the past. Pakistan is undoubtedly a more moderate and prosperous country since President Musharraf came to power. Despite this progress, we continue to believe that only civilian democracy can assure a secure and prosperous future for Pakistan. On November 5th, President Musharraf repeated his commitment to resign as Chief of Army Staff. We urge him to do so before he takes the oath of office to his second term. And we stand with the Pakistani people in expecting that he fulfill this promise. President Musharraf's resignation as Army Chief in itself will not represent a full transition to civilian rule in Pakistan, but it is an important step along that path. A crucial gauge of Pakistan's progress towards democracy will be the upcoming parliamentary elections. Prime Minister Aziz said on November 5th that the elections would take place as scheduled in January 2008. We again stand with the Pakistani people in urging their government to uphold its commitment to this important democratic benchmark. Whether the elections are free, fair, and transparent remains to be seen. We are doing our part through assistance programs geared towards improving electoral mechanisms. Secretary Rice said that we would be reviewing our assistance programs to Pakistan to see what actions or restrictions might be triggered by statute. And she said that while we did so, we needed to keep in mind that we have an obligation to protect the American people. She noted that much of our assistance in Pakistan contributes directly to our national interests and to the counterterrorism mission. Thanks to bipartisan congressional support, our assistance to Pakistan is accomplishing a great deal for the American and Pakistani people. Our programs are empowering Pakistan's moderate center to resist and eventually defeat a violent anti-democratic minority. Just as our earthquake assistance to Pakistan since 2005 has had a profoundly positive impact on the people of Pakistan, generating goodwill that has lasted to this very day. We envision our federally administrative, administered tribal areas program laying the foundation to permanently open this challenged environment to government and opportunity. We have a wide range of programs planned for the federally administered tribal areas, including security and law enforcement training, development and economic growth initiatives, democracy and human rights efforts, and ongoing infrastructure projects. These programs, along with the Reconstruction Opportunity Zone legislation that we have consulted 
about with Congress are critical to achieving our objectives in the war on terror. Likewise, our international military education and training and Fulbright exchange programs are building essential bridges between our country's leaders and people. Cutting these programs would send a negative signal to the people of Pakistan. The safety of our citizens and the stability of the region depend on nurturing the ties that we have begun to form. Long-term partnership with the Pakistani people is the only option for the United States. We cannot afford to have the on-again, off-again interactions that characterized our relationships in the past. Pakistan's future is too vital to our interests and our national security to ignore or to downgrade. Our challenge is to deal with the government in a way that supports the Pakistani people and helps them strengthen the influence of the moderate center in its fight against violent extremism. With strong congressional support of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship since 2001, we have helped the Pakistani people move down the path of moderation, stability, democracy, and prosperity. We are asking for congressional support in renewing our commitment to long-term partnership with the Pakistani people. There is not a mission in the world more deserving of our considered patience and steady engagement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my uh, opening statement. I'd be pleased to enter, try and answer any questions that you or other committee members might have. Thank you, Ambassador Negroponte. Let me first ask my friend, uh, gentleman from Indiana, if he would like to make an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I just uh, my statement would be to say uh, how grateful I am that you called this hearing at such a time as this. and. Uh, Welcome the ambassador, and out of deference to my colleagues who are gathered uh, to uh, uh, yield back the balance of my time. Um, thank you. Mr. Ambassador, first question I'd like to raise is what is the administration, administration's judgment about the feasibility of having truly free and fair elections in the immediate wake of what is essentially martial law, including a sacking of Supreme Court and other High Court justices, and the mass jailing of opposition political figures and human rights activists. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our, our view is that the electoral timetable that has been envis envisaged, that is to say, holding the elections for a new legislature sometime uh, around January of this coming year uh, should be adhered to. And we think that if, as uh, President Musharraf and those in his government have indicated, these emergency measures are lifted in the very near future, and uh, one assurance that, that we have been uh, repeatedly given is that they will be uh, lifted as quickly as possible. Uh, then we do believe that there is still time to organize reasonably fair and free elections. And that's something that we're very much prepared uh, to uh, try and support through the various uh, aid programs that I mentioned and that we think is still possible. Although, obviously, Mr. Chairman, the, the longer this emergency situation uh, goes on, uh, the more difficult, uh, I think, the political atmosphere uh, will become. Led by Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, several administration officials have indicated that our aid program to, uh, to uh, Pakistan will undergo a review. Now, I presume that review has not yet been completed, but may I ask uh, what are the conceptual alternatives you are considering in adjusting the aid program or terminating aid. Right. Uh, again, as I mentioned, our, our, our strong preference, Mr. Chairman, is that the government uh, terminate uh, the emergency uh, condition as soon as possible and get the country back on track 
uh, towards uh, the constitutional process and the elections that were envisaged. And the sooner that happens, uh, not only the better in terms of Pakistan's political development, but uh, I think the less uh, likely that uh, some uh, agoniz agonizing reappraisal, if you will, of our assistance programs uh, would be required. Uh, as you know, there are a number of uh, statutes that govern assistance to Pakistan. At the moment, we're undertaking uh, a review, but uh, we really haven't gotten to the point uh, where we're looking at the various alternatives uh, available to us. It's more a cataloging of the assistance uh, programs, having a look at uh, what is and what uh, might not be affected by the statutes concerned. Uh, our judgment at the moment is that there is nothing that is automatically triggered by the current situation, that everything is covered at the moment by appropriate uh, waivers. But obviously, if this situation continues on more indef indefinitely, it will um, undercut uh, the political support for um, continued, uh, at least certain aspects of our assistance programs. Shortly before she left for Pakistan, former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto visited me and we had a lengthy meeting. During the course of that meeting, it became clear to me, as it has to others, that she was thinking of developing some kind of a partnership with uh, President Musharraf. Um, she had hopes of working with him on a wide range of issues. And indeed, she asked me to call the Prime Minister, uh, uh, to call the President to arrange for security upon her arrival, which I did. And I was assured that that security would be forthcoming. Uh, recent statements by former Prime Minister Bhutto indicates a change of view. Could you enlighten us as to what the administration's dialogue with uh, Prime Minister Bhutto uh, indicates as to her present intentions? Uh, for, first of all, with respect to the uh former Prime Minister's security. This is an issue that she has uh, brought uh, to our attention uh, as well, Mr. Chairman, and it is something that we have raised with the government. Of course, it is the government of Pakistan that has uh, the full responsibility for pr providing uh, security for Ms. Bhutto, and our understanding is uh, that they are making uh, every appropriate effort to provide her with the requisite uh, security. As far as uh, what dialogue uh, we might have had and continue to have with uh, uh, former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto. First of all, I would say that uh, we at the embassy uh, in uh, Islamabad uh, have uh, tried to keep uh, our lines of communication uh, open uh, with all moderate uh, political leaders uh, in uh, Pakistan, including uh, Ms. Bhutto. We've also uh, tried to encourage uh, the moderate center, as I referred to in my remarks, and we think it is highly de desirable uh, that uh, the body politic in Pakistan coalesce around this moderate center as opposed to polarizing towards uh, extremes, so that we continue to believe that uh, individuals like Ms. Bhutto can play an important uh, role in the political future uh, of uh, Pakistan, and that uh, a dialogue uh, between uh, individuals such as herself and the government of Pakistan are to be encouraged. One of our ongoing complaints against the government of Pakistan has been its less than wholehearted commitment to fighting Taliban and al-Qaeda terrorism. What is the administration's current appraisal of the effectiveness of the government of Pakistan's effort
to put an end to terrorism by the various groups that I indicated and others. As I mentioned in my statement, Mr. Chairman, no country has done more in terms of inflicting damage and punishment on the Taliban and the al-Qaeda since 9-11. The record is quite impressive. And, of course, during my time as Director of National Intelligence, I had the opportunity to observe this kind of activity quite close up. So I think that we need to commend the government and the security forces of Pakistan for the work that they have done in that regard. Nonetheless, there is still room for increased cooperation between us, and more obviously can be done in terms of, particularly in terms of extending better control to the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan, which is probably where most of the violent extremism in Pakistan emanates from. And to that end, we have been very supportive of the Pakistani government's recent plans to develop the federally administrative tribal areas. That is why we have $150 million in our budget for economic and social assistance programs in that area. And we see the sort of medium and longer term plans to socially and economically develop that part of the country as part and parcel of the war on terror and the efforts to also root these people out with security forces. It hasn't been on the front burner visibly lately, but can you enlighten us as to what is our effort at the moment to bring about reconciliation between India and Pakistan? I think a lot of the effort has to be credited to the governments of India and Pakistan themselves. We had a more visible role back in 2002 when the two countries almost came to blows. I think they were pulled back from, successfully pulled back from the brink, thanks in part to the diplomatic efforts of one of my predecessors, Deputy Secretary of State Armitage. But since that time, they have established a comprehensive dialogue between them. They've worked on different aspects of the India-Pakistan relationship, trade, transportation, confidence building measures, and even some dialogue on the areas of serious dispute between them, such as Kashmir and a couple of the other border disputes. I would say that substantial progress has been made, and if Pakistan can get past the current political crisis that it confronts and the situation can be stabilized, that there is the hope of further progress in normalizing India-Pakistan relations. General Lady from Florida, Ms. Ileana Rasleyan. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, once again for being here. Two issues, the armed forces and analogies to Iran pre-'79. What can you tell us about the views of General Musharraf among senior members of the Pakistani armed forces? Are they concerned that his actions are discrediting the army, and would they prefer a genuinely civilian leadership? And on the Iran question, do you see any analogies between the U.S. support for General Musharraf and the current situation in Pakistan and the situation in Iran with the Shah before the fall of the Shah in 1979? Some have said that the U.S. has over-relied on a leader who has made efforts to modernize, but 
who has a shrinking base of support. Others say, well, if you use that analogy of Iran, you could say that we should have stayed uh, with the Shah and uh, Iran would be a, a, a better place now. If you could comment on both of those issues, armed yeah. forces and uh, Iran. Right. Thank, thank you for your question. I, on, this, on the second question first, um, I, I, I want to stress here, perhaps sometimes one uses the term, uh, one uses the name of the leader of a country as a shorthand for one's entire relationship with a country. And I think sometimes we all uh, tend to fall into to that pattern. Uh, but it's not about uh, supporting uh, one uh, political leader. Uh, we are... Uh, uh, it's not mine, Mr. Chairman, I assure you. <laughs> Uh, we are, uh, it's, it's, it's not about, uh, should I continue, Mr. Chairman? It's not about one leader. It's about helping uh, a country, helping, uh, uh, institutions, certainly helping uh, the transition to uh, democratic rule, the carrying out of elections. I mentioned the fact that we have uh, electoral assistance. It's about helping develop uh, the federally administered tribal areas. That's why we have this uh, substantial program. It's about supporting the Pakistani army and the Pakistani government because of the work that they have done to support us in Afghanistan, and that's a significant part of our military assistance. Having said that, of course, we, we do have a respect and admiration for the courageous leadership of, Mr., uh, of President Musharraf, and particularly the decision that he took uh, in late 2001 uh, when uh, he made a very, very strong uh, statement about the war on terror and support uh, and cooperation with us uh, yeah, with respect to Afghanistan. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a combination of factors, but it is not exclusively limited to support for one individual. As far as uh, the armed court, uh, forces are concerned, um, I, uh, I, I can't speak for how they feel about the situation at this particular moment. I, I think what I would say is uh, that my, my understanding is that they care about stability in their country, they want to be able to carry on uh, with their mission, and I think they, as others, including ourselves, would acknowledge that the current situation is a distraction from their very high priority security mission. And to the extent that this situation is prolonged, it will undercut these other security objectives, and nobody wants to see that. Thank you, sir. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I have tremendous respect and admiration for people who have faith. But our foreign policy should not be faith-based. I have tremendous respect for loyalty and the President's willingness to stand by his man in some cases is admirable, but it defies the fact that sometimes there should be consequences. The truth of the matter is that we are not doing this because we have the interests of the Pakistani people at heart, but because we're trying to protect a necessary thug. I remember when I was a young boy, very young, and my mother was trying to stop me from doing something I shouldn't have been doing, she said, you better stop that by the time I count to three. And it went one, two, two and a half, two and three quarters, two and five eighths, two and three sixteenths, two and three thirty seconds. I went on to be a math teacher, but I learned my mother had infinite patience. But if I did something that was seriously wrong, there were no fractions for the infraction. There were consequences. 
Should there be consequences to the markers we lay down, such as we want to establish democracies in the Middle East and then tolerate this kind of behavior when it suits us? Is that the lesson we're teaching? First of all, uh, Congressman, um, I, I can't agree with your characterization of the leadership of Pakistan. Um, I think that uh, the president is a, a committed individual who's been uh, working very hard in service of his country. Uh, you asked, you, you mentioned the, the notion of loyalty. Uh, this hasn't, and uh, we certainly have a, the president has, we have a good relationship with President Musharraf and with his government. Uh, that does not mean that we don't speak out when we think uh, a mistake has been made. And as I said in my comments, uh, we, st we strongly disagree with the move they uh, undertook. Mr. Secretary, I, I know that we strongly disagree with it, but to think that he's doing this in the interests of his people they know better. He's not arresting the terrorists on television in the past week. I, I'm he's not saying he away, did this. He's in, dragging in, away opposition and right. Supreme Court judges and trashing the Constitution and disregarding the law that he wrote because he didn't like the other law. And, he replaced the Supreme Court. And that is not an acceptable situation. Yeah, but that, doesn't there have to eventually be consequences? Listen, I've been a fan and a supporter, and I want him to succeed. It's important with our with our with our security interests in the Middle East. But in the end you're gonna have the story of Iran. You're gonna you're gonna be supporting a guy like the Shah who 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 was tough on terrorists and did things that we need and, and in the end the results were absolutely and totally disastrous and not one Iranian thought that we were supporting him because it was in their interests. I would offer the comment that this is a very delicate situation. That uh Basically, the political future of Pakistan is for the people of Pakistan to decide. We favor their moving in a democratic direction. We think it is in their best interest to do that, both in the interest of the political development of their country and in terms of the war on terror and support is for our efforts. Is there any human rights violation he could conceivably commit that would change your mind and drop our support? and get some other phone numbers of some other generals who could be equally well, I, helpful? Well, I would say this in reply to that, uh, Congressman. I think that the longer this situation goes on uh, in, in its present form, uh, the more difficult uh, it, it is going to become. Uh, and that is why we believe it is so important uh, that this state of emergency uh, end as uh, absolutely soon as possible, uh, to not confront us with the kinds of choices, so as to not confront us with the kinds of choices that you were describing. Mr. Secretary, I very much want to be won over. And I, I have to see President Musharraf, who has done some great things. I have to see some movement on his part to try to make better what he has made very bad. Yield back. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just like to say that uh, I agree with my colleagues about uh, having uh, uh, a solution that uh, uh, will meet with our goals of uh, freedom, democracy, and human rights and all those things we believe in. But, you know, one of the things that concerns me is that <clears throat> you have to look at the world the way it is and not the way you want it to be sometimes. I think Bobby Kennedy said that a long time ago. The gentlelady from Florida and the gentleman from New York just both alluded to the situation that took place in Iran some time ago. And I think we ought to all take a hard look at history. We were the ones that led the fight to get the Shah out. We led the fight to get the Shah out. And we helped bring the Ayatollah back. Now, I don't think anybody in retrospect would say that was a good thing. Iran is now a, a, a radical terrorist state, in large part due to what we did when the Shah was there, now I'm not saying the Shah did the right thing, I'm not saying that there wasn't human rights violations, but, you know, we, we have to look at the world the way it really is. Right now, uh, Pakistan is a friend and ally of the United States. There are internal problems, there's just no question about that, and we want to do what we can to work with them 
to solve these problems and to make sure that the things that we believe in prevail. But to start putting tremendous pressure on President Musharraf, who has been our friend and ally, who's helped us in the fight against terrorism, could lead to the same thing we saw back when the Shah was removed. We force Musharraf out, we beat the hell out of him and see him removed, and what do you think is going to happen? I mean, we all want to see democracy, we all want to see freedom and human rights, but we might very well get the same thing we saw back when the Shah was removed, and I don't think we want to see that. We are in a nuclear age. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. We cannot allow a radical Islamist fundamentalist government to take place over there. And Musharraf is a stabilizing force as far as the entire area is concerned when you look at the world picture. So I think we've got to be very, very careful about this. Sometimes free elections don't give us exactly what we want. I remember in Gaza when we said we have to have free elections in Gaza. We didn't get exactly what we wanted there. I don't think anybody thinks we got what we wanted there. And we pushed on Israel to get rid of, uh, 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 I'm talking about the West Bank, we pushed on Israel to give Gaza back uh, to the, uh, the people over there. And what happened? The minute, the minute it was over with, uh, the uh, opposition started lobbying uh, rockets into Israel. And we've got a very unstable situation over there right now as well. So um, I want to see things change in Pakistan. I want to see moderation uh, occur. I want to see human rights and democracy and and, and all the things we've been talking about, we must realize one thing. And that is, if we're not careful, we're going to see the same thing happen that happened in Iran. And Pakistan is a nuclear power. We cannot allow the same thing that happened in Iran to happen in Pakistan, and we have to be very careful. And this Congress has to be very careful in the way we address this and the things we say, because we may end up getting the same thing that we got in Iran, and it's something we don't want, especially in the nuclear age, and I yield back to balance my time. <laughs> Mr. Fala Mavega. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, thank you again for coming to uh, testify before this committee, and I want to say that we dearly appreciate your service to our nation. As you know, Mr. Secretary, Section 508 of the Sanctions Law under the uh, Foreign Operations Act stipulates that whenever a military coup takes place in any country, our government places sanctions against that country, and we make demands that that country should return to democracy and have elections. Two recent examples were the military coups that took, took place in Fiji and Thailand, and we immediately placed sanctions against these two countries and demanded that they return to democracy and calling for new elections, etc. I visited recently with the leaders of Thailand let me tell you that they were so disappointed when we did this to them. And given the fact that their own unique and their own political way, they were able now to make plans to hold elections. And yet, after eight years, we've not made such demands against General Musharraf. I want to quote from you an article written by former Prime Minister Budo that appeared in today's New York Times. She quoted President Bush and said in his second inaugural address and saying, all who live in tyranny and hopelessness can know that the United States will not ignore your oppression or excuse your oppressors. When you stand for your liberty, we will stand with you." End of quote. My question is, do you believe we're applying a double standard here? Do you believe we should revisit Section 508 of the Sanctions Law and establish a more equitable and fair process so that we can be more consistent uh, with our basic fundamental values principles of freedom and democracy, and not just for us, but for the world. Uh, Congressman, Pakistan has been under, I guess they call them coup sanctions, uh, since President mm -hmm. Musharraf came to power in 1999. Uh, but as you know, in October 2001, Congress uh, recognize the urgent need to provide assistance to Pakistan to respond to the terrorist threat, and it passed the Pakistan Waiver Act, and so that, that provided the President with the authority to waive the coup restrictions to enable United States, uh, the United States government to provide assistance to Pakistan. And this is really the balancing act that we're involved in here uh, as, as we speak, which is on the one hand, uh, we want to show our concern for democracy and political developments uh, in that country. And on the other hand, there's the criticality 
of providing Pakistan with assistance because of the fact that it neighbors uh, Afghanistan, that is a critical partner in the war on terror. Uh, and I think that this is just something that uh, a situation that we're just going to continue to to have to manage my concern uh, going Mr. forward. My concern, Mr. Secretary, is that it's been eight years uh, since this gentleman took over the government. He ousted two former prime ministers. Osama bin Laden, by the way, who was responsible for 9-11, is still not captured. And I believe as long as he lives, there's going to create a, a much greater uh, participation and willingness of those uh, extremists that believe in the same things that, uh, uh, that they want to do in, in, in destroying our national security. And I just, I just kind of wanted to, to ask you, we're making an exception. So you're saying then that uh, let's just forget about democracy and freedom for now. Uh, let's continue having this uh, gentleman continue being the military dictator by, that he by is. By no means. By no means are we uh, saying uh, let's just forget about that aspect of the situation. In fact, uh, I have just was passed a note. Our, our own president at a press conference just a few moments ago said, this was a message to President uh, Musharraf, uh, you cannot be the president and the head of the military at the same time. Uh, president Bush just said that at his press, press conference with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Sarkozy. So I think that uh, you know we're all we're all pushing the, and, the democracy uh, message, and yeah. and while it may not be the optimal moment to uh, defend the political record of the government of Pakistan, I would like to make one point which is that in those years that you've referred to, Congressman, there have been some improvement in the human rights uh, and civil, civil society situation. For example, the press is freer. There are more uh, uh, radio and TV stations and so forth. But uh, again, it's, it's hard to make that case at this particular moment in time. I recognize that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ambassador, for being here. And I uh, have had the opportunity to uh, visit uh, President Musharraf twice in Islamabad. I um, actually, it's my view uh, that the challenges that he has been facing are just so extraordinary. Um, the uh, madrasas, uh, the uh, lack of ability to uh, provide security in Waziristan and the uh, frontier. Um, and, and I know that uh, you've been proposing um, in, in your statements, uh, what can we do to uh, help him to uh, adjust to indeed um, providing for a peaceful and uh, democratic solution to the dilemma that he's in now? Well, I, certainly, uh, I, I, we're sending him a strong message about how we think the democracy agenda uh, is important. I think we're also saying that we think it's in uh, his own and in the self-interest of his country and in the self-interest of the security and stability of Pakistan in the long term. I think the other uh, thing we can do is I, I think we, we should con continue uh, these important uh, programs uh, that uh, are helpful both in the war on terror and in, and in helping uh, encourage uh, development and moderation in the country of Pakistan. It's a, this is a country that needs our assistance uh, in many different ways uh, to help uh, modernize its society. So I think we want to send uh, both the president and the people and government of Pakistan the message that uh, the United States wants to be a reliable partner. We don't want to have uh, uh, wild swings up and down, ups and downs in the relationship, and that we want to be a consistent, reliable partner who is committed to their security, uh, to their economic development, and to uh, uh, democratic uh, evolution of their country. Another interest I have is uh, as the co-chair of the uh, caucus of India and Indian Americans. Um, what do you see the uh, relationship uh, in, uh, between Pakistan and India under the current circumstance? It's gotten better uh, since uh, 2002. There's been uh, they've developed this uh, comprehensive 
uh, dialogue uh, between them on various aspects of the relationship. Uh, they've been discussing some of their border uh, disputes, and uh, there's been some uh, um, there's been some good discussion there. Uh, there's been uh, efforts to uh, uh, restrain uh, terrorist uh, uh, movement of uh, terrorists across uh, the borders. So I think that uh, all in all, uh, the India-Pakistan relationship is about as good as it's been in recent years. And if the current political situation in Pakistan can stabilize, I see the perspective of even greater progress in the India-Pakistan relationship. And, and a concern that I have uh, that is that a destabilized Pakistan could indeed uh, interrupt the progress that you've mentioned, including uh, travel between the countries and uh, the uh, increase in trade between the two com countries and um, is there anything that India could do to help uh, in terms of uh, working towards stability? Well, I think uh, perhaps most importantly not to try in any way to take advantage of the situation and I don't see in any indications that they are. So I think that's positive. If you look back at the historical record, there were times when uh, uh, they did try to take advantage of political instability in Pakistan. So I think that's a, a net plus, and I think they just, um, uh, to the extent that they can try and keep the relationship on an even keel, I think that that would be a positive contribution. And, and again, I, I very much appreciate you pointing out uh, that there has been success in reduction of cross-border terrorism. Uh, from Pakistan into India. That is just crucial uh, toward uh, the development between these two very important strategic allies of the United States. That is my understanding of what has happened. I yield the balance of my time. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I, I listened to, uh, to Mr. Ackerman's uh, criticism of, of Musharraf, and, and I agree with, with what he said. I listened to Mr. Burton's talk about how we better be careful, because uh, we don't want a repetition of what happened in Iran, and I agree with what he said. And the question is, how can they both be right? And they both are. Um, the, the truth, uh, Mr. Negroponte, is that we, we are really caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, it's very difficult, and it's very hard uh, for us to maneuver. I, I listen to your testimony, and, and, and I, I glean from it that we're, we're trying to send a strong message, uh, because what Mr. Musharraf has done is unacceptable. On the other hand, we worry about what might come after him, which might be uh, far, far worse. Um, when Benazir Bhutto uh, returned, uh, triumphantly, she was uh, almost assassinated, and many of us, of course, worry about future attempts on her life. Uh, it would obviously be a, a, a tragedy, not only a personal tragedy to her, but a, a blow to Pakistani democracy if anything were to happen to her. Uh, we, um, have we made it clear to Mr. Musharraf that her protection is a priority? Uh, we have, sir. We've inquired about uh uh, her security with the government. Uh, we uh, have uh, – that's been a subject of uh, a number of discussions uh, between ourselves and the government, although, as I said earlier, it is the responsibility of the government uh, to provide the necessary protection uh, to Ms. Uh, Bhutto, and we're satisfied that they're uh, – they are uh, uh, doing what they can in that regard. Let, let me make a point, though, that uh, on her return, uh, when uh, – the bombing, the, the, the uh, horrific bombing occurred, I think that uh, most people would attribute that event to extremist uh, elements. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, uh, many of us feel that uh, this is the kind of situation that uh, al-Qaeda and other like-minded extremists uh, might uh, seek uh, to exploit, and we even do have some indications that that they they see an opportunity here, and so I think we have to be wary of uh, of behavior by by Al Qaeda and others at this particular juncture. It's a very delicate time, and and I think uh, there is the danger 
that they will continue to try and exploit this kind of a situation. Well, I, I agree, but, but it, is, it is true that, um, um, you know, we, we, have, we have wished, uh, someone said before, Osama bin Laden still hasn't been captured, and, and that is a symbol of, of how many of us feel that, that Mr. Musharraf has, has not gone after uh, the, the terrorists and, and the al-Qaeda people as, as much as he's going after his democratic opposition right now. And that's something that really, really, uh, really bothers us. Um, the national elections, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that we were, you hope that he would resign as, as Army Chief of Staff, and we've urged him to do so. Um, this, what repercussions are there if he doesn't resign? I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, if he doesn't resign, it shows that he's moving the wrong way towards democracy. Um, democratic elections really can't be free unless Benazir Bhutto and, and also Mr. Sharif, in my opinion, are allowed to come back and participate. Um, do you agree with that about Mr. Sharif? And ha are we taking a position on Sharif being allowed to return from, from exile? And so, and also, uh, what about what if he doesn't resign as Army Chief of Staff? Would right. would our administration's position well, change? Let, let let me answer the question about the repercussions and what if he doesn't uh, uh, doesn't take off the uniform? I, I just mentioned that. I mean, I, our own president now publicly, firmly on record, urging him to take off the uniform. I, I, I think we feel that if he doesn't especially having committed to do so on uh, several occasions, there will be, reper there will be the, the principal repercussions will be political inside of Pakistan uh, uh, itself. There are uh, various political actors who feel it is important to hold the president uh, to that commitment, and, that, and if it is not kept, I think you're going to uh, see a strong uh, uh, reaction from from those different uh, elements, so I think that's probably the principal uh, repercussion. But it will also uh, be be an issue for us, uh, and we're we're hoping that it. Uh, uh, you're asking me a hypothetical, and and uh, hopefully it doesn't turn out uh, to be the case. Although I suspect if it does turn out to be the case, I'll be up here more often. Have we taken Gentlemen, this? time has I, expired. I'm wondering if I could have him answer my question about Mr. Sharif, if we have taken a position on him being allowed to return. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, wasn't trying to avoid that. that I, I mean, that is an issue uh, between the government of Pakistan and, and Mr. Sharif. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, um, there had been dialogue between them before about the terms and conditions under which he uh, had been released from detention a number of years back and that he had committed to staying out of the country for a decade. Um, I, I think we'll just have to see how that issue evolves. Gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Inglis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, how would you assess the relative strengths of the various factions, the, the moderates, the military, and the extremists? Uh, who has the upper hand? Um, what was your sense of how much strength is in each of those pockets? I, I think that's a, a very, I think it's very good, but a very difficult question to give you a, a precise answer to. I think as a general rule, and we were talking about this uh, as I was preparing for the hearing, that um, the moderate, the, the extremists are not many in number, but of course they, um, um, ha it tends to use more extreme methods to achieve uh, their objectives, so they're, they are uh, dangerous uh, in that regard. Um, I think that the large majority of uh, Pakistanis uh, probably uh, want uh, to pursue a, a moderate uh, path. I think that at this juncture, and given the political and security developments in that country, um, I wouldn't say either side predominates as between the military on the one hand and the civil, civil political forces on the other. I think the important thing is that they work together. I think they cannot do without each other over the longer term, and that partnership between them is really the answer to achieving a, a modicum of political stability and progress in that country. Is it, is it possible, though, that the partnership is the other way? 
had some indication that perhaps the military isn't exactly um, what you would expect. Perhaps they they really are. They have extremist elements. I mean, is that the there, there have been times in the past when the military, particularly uh, during the um, period uh, of the struggle against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, that there were ties between the jihadist elements in Afghanistan and the Pakistan military that developed over the years, mm -hmm. uh, which led to some of the kinds of uh, relationships and associations that you're referring to. But I think that's taken a turn uh, in a more moderate direction. I think markedly so in the last, uh, uh, during the course of the past year, because uh, there's growing concern amongst the military and other elements of Pakistani society about what they call Talibanization, uh, both in the tribally administered, the federally administered tribal areas, as well as in some of the lowland areas. They, uh, you've noticed there's been some increase in uh, suicide bombings and extremist activities, and that's been a cause of concern on the part of President Musharraf, the military, and I believe the society as a whole. What's your, trying that first one in sort of a slightly different way, what's your assessment of the moderates' insistence and commitment to democratic kind of principles? Is that strong enough that they will, by moral authority, bring that in, or is it, is it a, a crushable kind of uh, motivation? I, um, Pakistan has uh, grown a lot in recent years. I talked about the 7% economic growth rate. I think civic, civil society has, has grown, particularly in the major urban areas. There are some very uh, uh, highly educated, uh, Western trained uh, elements uh, in the society. So I think that, the, and, and of course we live in an information era so that it is uh, hard to suppress the flow of information back and forth uh, between countries and throughout society. So I think that uh, these elements are probably uh, um, in a position of increasing strength. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Delahunt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm just going to make some observations, and at this time remaining, I would be interested in your response. Um, it's my own belief that the vast majority of Pakistanis fit under the term moderates. You've quoted polls and there's no doubt that, uh, again, uh, upwards of 70 percent of Pakistanis reject terrorism, reject the Taliban, reject, reject extremists in their society. I, I, I wonder if we're using the right definition in terms of extremisms. It's clear, at least from my perspective, that, and you use the term encourage moderation, encourage the moderates, yet from all reports it's the moderates, the democratic elements within Pakistan, that are being attacked by the Musharraf government. And that's the bottom line. Um, they are under assault. And I'm very concerned that we are going to, once again, uh, align ourselves, not with the democratic elements within that society, but with a despot, a militarist, if you will. To call the 70 community leaders who were arrested in Lahore while they were munching on cookies and having tea extremists, uh, I think is a mistake. They belonged to the Human Rights Commission in Pakistan. They were, those that were detained included a, a college dean, a poet, an economics professor, and a board member of the International Crisis Group, which many of us in this DS are very familiar with. They do outstanding work. You talked about the growth of the media in Pakistan. I'm sure you're aware that an anchor, Mr. Hamid Mir, with Pakistan's independent TV network, GEO, said Tuesday that that station's 
chief executive had been taken to a safe house operated by the country's intelligence service and accused of anti-Pakistani activities. I would suggest that the extremists are part of the Musharraf government that are perpetrating those kind of human rights violations, let alone rejecting their own constitution. You also talk about, in your prepared remarks, you refer to a, a Pew poll. Well, there was a recent poll that was done by the uh, International Republic, Republican Institute that mirrored the figures that you provided to us. At the same time, they go on to indicate, and this is prior to the emergency delegation, that 83 percent of the Pakistani people rejected any kind of an emergency order such as been promulgated by this government, 83 percent. What is particularly disturbing, however, is the attitude of the Pakistani people towards the United States. And I didn't see that in your prepared statement. But some 15 percent have a positive view of the United States and our policies. Uh, in fact, 64 percent of that poll indicate that they have a particular concern in terms of the United States being a threat to Pakistan, which exceeds the 45 percent that feel that way about their long-term rival, India. I'm very concerned, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ambassador, that we're going down a path here that will have consequences far beyond just Pakistan, but all over the Islamic world, in how we are viewed that will undermine our national security, that will hold us up as a, the epitome of hypocrisy if we don't make a clear stand for democracy and the democratic forces in Pakistan. If you wish to comment, take whatever time I have left. Um, I guess I would just comment on the, on the last part of your statement, Congressman, which is uh, I certainly don't see it as an act of uh, what, what we're saying up here as an act of hypocrisy. I think we've been rather candid about uh, uh, the rather difficult situation and the difficult challenge we face here. Uh, somebody used the phrase uh, between a rock uh, and a hard place. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, at least two very important uh, sets of interests here. One is the, at the advancement of towards uh, some kind of democratic rule in that country, and the other is uh, protecting vital security interests of the United States in a country. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Ambassador, for a moment. I think the Pakistani people time, on our side. Your time has expired. We'll yeah, let I, to the I, ambassador finish his I, I, answer. Just to finish my sentence, Mr. Chairman, that's all which is that uh, in a country where there are uh, individuals, uh, either al-Qaeda or al-Qaeda affiliates, uh, whom we know uh, are plotting uh, harm uh, to the homeland uh, of the United States and to United States interests uh, around the world. This is a very serious matter. Gentleman from California, Mr. Orobaka. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the Ambassador for all the great service that he's provided uh, over my many years here in Washington. He's been involved in several of the uh, issues of the day at the time when uh, we were a great threat uh, uh, was upon us, and he helped uh, pull America through, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, I, do, I disagree with my colleague from uh, Massachusetts about the hypocrisy, uh, but I would uh, su suggest that uh, there is a certain lack of courage on the part of this administration and others, other administrations as well, to fully try to believe in the democratic ideals that we express. Uh, and let me just note, 
who cares if General Mucharov takes off his uniform? It's time for him to go. I don't care if he's in his uniform or out of his uniform. It's time for him to go. He has been a political juggler, and he has failed at that. He's been a political juggler instead of a leader. He's been a chameleon instead of a bold opponent to radical Islam or even a champion of moderation in his own country. And yet we're sticking with this failure. And uh, when there is an alternative, we've got other leaders there. Benazir Bhutto is there and available as an alternative. Uh, Musharraf and his uh, ISI and the military have been the best friends of the radicals in Pakistan for as long as my memory. And I've been deeply involved in that since the Afghan war with the Soviets. They, were the, they created the Taliban. You know that. You just mentioned it uh, in passing. They were the ones who have permitted this madras uh, school system that creates radical Islamists instead of educated children who could live a decent life. They're the ones who oversaw the creation of a heroin empire that now exists and undermines everything we're trying to do. It's time for us to drop this guy and go to the real forces of moderation in that society. The fact is, the military has been the enemy of the moderates in Pakistan and been the friend of the radical Islamists who are our enemies. Uh, this is a, we have been sold a bill of goods that this guy is, is some way like the Shah of Iran who was the opponent of the radical Islamists. He is not. Behind the scenes, this is the man who oversaw this great expansion of radical Islamic uh, power in that part of the world. It's time for us to let him go. It's time for us to start just really supporting the moderates and have the courage to understand if we really stand with democracy, in the end it will work out for us. But if, it, if not, none of the moderates will ever believe in the United States in the long run anyway. And I'll be very happy for you to uh, disagree with me and show me where I'm wrong, but that's coming from the heart. Um, I, I think where I'd uh, answer you on that, uh, Congressman, is with your point about their support, their alleged support for the radical uh, elements. I, I believe that with the uh, occurrence of 9-11 uh, and the war in Afghanistan, and now particularly, as I mentioned to Congressman uh, Inglis in reply to his question, with the uh, Taliban and extremist elements starting to operate uh, in the federally administered tribal areas and even in the lowlands, I think there's a, a, a strong realization uh, about the extremist uh, threat uh, in that country. And I think that uh, it is a threat that uh, President Musharraf has been and uh, continues to uh, uh, seek to face up to. Uh, so that. Uh, that would be my first point, and I think uh, I would say likewise with respect to dealing with the issue of, of extremism and the madrasas and so forth. Uh, right. Well, I, I, I stand by what I said uh, Congressman, I, I believe that there's been a, a, a shift in attitudes, and as Congressman Dillahunt was saying, I think attitudes in Pakistan uh, are um, moderate and, uh, and against this kind of extremist activity, and I think there's a general recognition in that society that that's a problem and it needs to be dealt with and dealt with effectively because otherwise it will impede uh, the development uh, of that country. Uh, uh, the only other uh, point I would make is I'm not sure it's a, a, an, an appropriate way to characterize a situation as to whether we drop somebody as a leader or not drop them. Uh, our support is to the, okay. to the people and the government of Pakistan. Uh, their political future is for the political forces and the political actors in that country to decide. Uh, and uh, the, the only role we can play is uh, that of providing uh, encouragement uh, and support. But I think this is something that they themselves are going to have to decide. Well said. Thank you. Gentlemen from... Uh, 
Yesterday, both the Washington Post and the New York Times ran striking photographs uh, on their front page. Uh, the front page above the fold, New York Times, was of a dark-suited attorney dressed kind of like the way I am, uh, getting tear gassed. And the front page of the Washington Post was of another attorney uh, be being beaten by uh, plainclothes police. And um, I just try to imagine what it would take for some of my friends at Simpson Thatcher or Cravath to be out on Wall Street, you know, getting beaten by the cops. Uh, what would motivate them strongly enough to do that? And if that were to happen in our society, uh, what that would indicate for uh, the core support uh, for uh, whichever government had uh, motivated dark-suited attorneys to get out in the street and get tear gassed. Um, now, we had a little bit of a challenge in 2000 with a disputed election, and when our Supreme Court voted five to four, uh, everybody saluted and we moved on. Uh, President Musharraf uh, dissolved the Supreme Court and has put the Chief Justice uh, under arrest. I would like to think that we have moved beyond uh, our Cold War doctrine of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, and um, well, I, I don't want to hold up the photographs, but I do want to turn to two quotes in today's New York Times, uh, which is, um, uh, first of all, um, that um, the general is keeping the opposition political parties uh, out of the political arena, arena, and as a result, the vacuum was filled by religious forces. Uh, now Musharraf is targeting the liberal forces of this country, yet they are the ones, the liberal forces are the ones who want to fight extremism. And the statement that I want to focus on is expressions from the United States are taken seriously here and I feel the United States ought to put its foot down. Um, and this is sp said by a gentleman who's a corporate lawyer whose uh, firm has represented General Musharraf in the past. Uh, what is preventing our government from speaking more forcefully on behalf of the rule of law uh, and uh, support of the existing constitution uh, of uh, the state of Pakistan? I think we certainly have been forthright. We've, we've said we felt this, uh, we strongly disagreed with it. We think that uh, well, the president... Uh, Mr. Ambassador, with all due respect, it appears that that message has not gotten through if, if this gentleman is saying expressions from the United States are taken seriously here, and I feel the United States ought to put its foot down. I, I, I think the indication is that, that the United States is equivocating or, or, that, or that the silence is deafening. Right. Well, I was quoting earlier what our president had just said. Um, I mentioned in my own testimony that we strongly uh, agreed, uh, disagreed with what uh, Mr. Musharraf uh, did. Uh, we think it was a mistake. Um, I think uh, uh, my point is that we're trying to encourage the, the political process, which has been derailed. We were the first to acknowledge that. It has been the, the progress towards elected uh, assembly and constitutional government has been derailed by now, President Mr. Musharraf's have, action, have, and Mr. we are trying to encourage have, it back on track we, as quickly have, have as we, possible. Have we communicated this clearly to President Musharraf well, and to the news media in Pakistan? Uh, well, as clearly as, as I can right now, and we have certainly had uh, diplomatic exchanges with uh, with President uh, Musharraf and uh, our embassy, uh, as a matter of fact, in, uh, right in the aftermath of the the, uh, the move by by the government, uh, spoke up uh, to express uh, serious concern uh, about the crackdown. So uh, yes, I think our I think our position is quite clear. So you you think our public diplomacy 
has been effective and clear in this instance. Well, I can't, I can't argue that it's been particularly effective yet because we haven't seen the kind of change that we'd like to see uh, occur, which is for the president to uh, agree to take off his uh, uniform before he gets sworn in for his second term and to uh, publicly and explicitly and clearly uh, set a date for legislative elections. That's the action we would like to see. So let me just... Gentleman uh, Stein has expired. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your service to our country. I, uh, when Secretary Rice testified two weeks ago, uh, I asked her about Pakistan. Uh, I've, I've been concerned about it, as I know you have, for quite some time. They have been an, an, an effective, to some extent, ally in the war on terror. Uh, but they have produced characters like Ramzi Youssef, responsible for the 93 World Trade Center, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, his uncle, who was the mastermind of September the 11th. Uh, they are actively recruiting and training terrorists. We, uh, the, the London arrests, primarily, again, Pakistan. We think bin Laden is hiding, by all accounts, somewhere in the tribal regions in Pakistan-Afghan uh, border. Um, AQ Khan, of course, developed the nuclear capability for Pakistan. So you throw all these ingredients together, <clears throat> and, and of course, an ISI that's had a record of kind of playing both sides of the aisle at times. Uh, you throw the nuclear capability that they already have, uh, and it, it, it is a ticking time bomb. Uh, I know that the support from Musharraf has been important to create stability. Um, but this power-sharing arrangement, which I know Ms. Bhutto was interested in, in, in achieving, um, and I know that you, as I understand, support it. I want to read from the Wall Street Journal yesterday, said that she was supposed to share power after, after the elections with Mr. Musharraf on the assumption that a liberal civil military coalition government would be able to better tackle the war against religious extremism and terrorism in Pakistan. That is in danger of, of a shipwreck. Um, can you comment on what you're doing to help in this power-sharing arrangement and, and what we're doing to help Ms. Bhutto? Well, what I would say is, first of all, we have encouraged over time in recent months the dialogue between the government uh, and, and Ms. Bhutto. Uh, we also remain in close contact uh, with her so that we have uh, the best possible understanding of her uh, perspective on things. And needless to say, we stay uh, in touch uh, uh, with the government. So uh, while we're not the centerpiece of this process, we have certainly uh, played a role of encouragement and uh, sought to uh, be uh, facilitative where we could. And as a follow-up, Ms. Bhutto in this article alleges that an ISI officer was uh, responsible for the attempted assassination attempt. Uh, an ISI brigadier who's a close friend of Musharraf. Do you have any information? I, I, that? I do not. And uh, as I said earlier, I, I believe that this was a, 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 a terrorist attempt by uh, an extremist element such as uh, al-Qaeda or some related uh, group. Uh, the other point I'd make er, to your earlier comment about cooperation uh, in uh, the war on terror, uh, yeah, uh, there have been, been issues in, the, uh, in our cooperation, but I'd say uh, on balance uh, it's been strong, and uh, if you as I said in my opening statement, the, the record of Pakistan having captured and uh, disrupted uh, terrorist activities uh, in their country is substantial. Some of the most important al-Qaeda figures that have been captured were captured in Pakistan. So mm -hmm. I think the point is we want to encourage uh, the positive behavior through a, a constructive relationship with the government of Pakistan. And we ha I think there's nothing to be gained by somehow uh, uh, estranging ourselves from them. And I, just to uh, uh, echo that, I, I know that a lot of the, whether it was uh, Ramzi Youssef or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the London arrests as well uh, were uh, made uh, uh, with the cooperation of the, the Pakistani government. So mm -hmm. yeah. I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman.
gentlelady from Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding uh, this uh, timely hearing and uh, thank the ambassador for his uh, presence here. Welcome. Uh, I want to ask uh, just a straightforward question and then uh, some comments and, and hopefully we can find an opportunity for a common agreement. I think the brief comment that I'll make is that you can sense from members of Congress here on this committee, and I've not heard all of the questioning, that there is consternation and concern uh, about America's involvement uh, in Pakistan. My simple first question is, uh, are we in our foreign policy at this point propping up the government of President Musharraf? Is, is that, would that be your interpretation? Mr. Musharraf's government existed before we ever resumed assistance to the government of Pakistan. So I'd say that uh, that he arrived at uh, at office through uh, uh, the Pakistani uh, political. But but if I may quickly, process, in, in this I, crisis, would you characterize our actions as propping up his no, government? No, no, I would not. Okay. And and that's let, let me pursue a sure, line of questioning on that, on that basis. Um, we have um, a uh, difficult uh, set of circumstances here. Uh, Pakistan has been noted as an ally, uh, even beyond the government. There is a vigorous middle class, a growing middle class uh, in Pakistan, who I believe uh, have reasonable alliance uh, with the United States, along with a vigorous Pakistani-American community. And I would uh, make the point that we had uh, maybe unfortunate results in Iran when the United States was involved. But on the other hand, we look at North Korea, completely oppressive, very few people in the street, uh, yet we were able to negotiate a reasonable resolve around the nuclear, which means uh, that uh, I hope we were not considering ourselves propping up the government, but we were considering ourselves finding some resolution to a crisis. I think that is where we need to be now with Pakistan, finding a resolution to a crisis and not being considered propping up a government. And the only way that you can topple Musharraf, I would imagine, is for us to take up arms. I can't imagine anyone suggesting that. I'm not interested in going into Iran, and I'm not interested in going into Pakistan. But what I would say is that you need a firmer, stronger, and determined approach. And I will give you letters, you know, uh, I have been uh, advocating for a diplomatic team, and I know that we have quality people on the ground, but a diplomatic team, an envoy, I would even suggest uh, former President Clinton, uh, and there are others, uh, including those who are here in the State Department as we speak, but a firm team that goes uh, beyond the admiral who visited uh, and concretely announce and lay out some of the very issues that have been stated here. One. Uh, some people don't care if he's a chief or not, but uh, step down. That was one of his agreements. Restore immediately uh, constitutional authority. Release those detained persons, lawyers, uh, and obviously immediately set uh, the elections uh, going forward. Um, one thing that we have not been able to denote, and a lot of people argue, is whether or not the Pakistani military, for example, has been effective in helping us fight uh, the uh, terrorists. We have not been good in explaining that from the Defense Department on down because many people argue they're in bed with them. I think they've done some forward uh, thinking efforts and there have been some successes as there have been some failures. But I think what I'd like you to, to answer, one, I'd offer this suggestion as a, as a team and I, so Secretary, I'd like not to hear that this one has been over and that one's been over because it's different when you have uh, a concerted effort, a pronouncement. And then I think it is, it should be a demand, it should be a requirement, short of holding back funds, that Musharraf respond affirmatively to our suggestions because of the relationship that we've had uh, with that government on behalf of the Pakistani people. I'll yield to you. Well, if I understood the, the kind of a agenda you laid out, I, I don't think I have any quarrel with that. I mean, you're, uh, we're, we're talking about the same thing. I mean, we. We said we think he ought to take off his uniform. He, the elections ought to be scheduled. And um, these uh, draconian measures that they've taken in recent days uh, need to be scaled back. 
So I don't think that you and I have any problem on the substance. Would you entertain a special team going over to reinforce in a stronger manner, and then would you entertain the whole question of our funding, which has to be considered, not something that I necessarily advocate, but would you consider that so that he would listen, short of military action? Well, the difficulty on the funding part is, of course, who is going to be hurt if you cut the funding? And the concern we have is it will hurt programs and activities and interests that are important to us, in spite of whom or notwithstanding who happens to be president of Pakistan, whether it's in the border regions or it's economic development activities that help the Pakistani people. So that's the difficulty we think we face with respect to contemplating funding cuts in a country so critical to our security interests as Pakistan. Well, I thank the chairman, and I have a letter for you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. The gentleman from California, Mr. Royce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, I'd like to go to one of your statements here in your report. You say President Musharraf has been indispensable in the war on terror. And I would just like to make the observation. I chaired the Africa subcommittee for a number of years. We made a mistake, in my opinion, during the Cold War in considering certain individuals indispensable. We never said they were indispensable, but we considered them indispensable. We personalized our foreign policy in that way. And in my view, and I was in Pakistan earlier this year, met with President Musharraf at the time, and went up to the border region, went into the frontier. I can tell you the one thing that's indispensable in Pakistan is the rule of law. And the rule of law has been, frankly, overturned. And I think the international community, including this Congress, are waiting to see if there's any hope that the elections that were scheduled for January are going forward. And not only going forward, but whether or not civil society, the representatives of the class of society that are interested in human rights, whether or not the lawyers, the candidates, the human rights activists are going to be released from jail so that those elections are, frankly, meaningful, so that they're actually elections. If that happens, then I think Pakistan can resist the fall into the abyss. But if it does not happen, if instead the military in the country does not understand where public opinion is inside the country and where world opinion is, if there's a failure to comprehend the damage done to civil society and the perception that the struggle, which should be against the jihadists, is instead turned against the representatives of civil society, that the troops that should be out there tracing down the leads on the 800 Pakistani civilians killed by suicide bombers over the last few months and by attacks from radical elements are instead in the business of jailing the people that are involved in evolving that society into a representative democracy, then I think Pakistan is on a very perilous course. And I think that that is the issue and the message that should be delivered rather than that any one person is indispensable. We appreciate the role that the military in Pakistan has played in taking on radical elements. Our hearts go out for the thousands killed in that effort and their family members, the grieving spouses and families for Pakistani soldiers who were killed in the fight on the frontier provinces. But at the same time, now is the time for everybody who is clear-eyed about the future to understand the steps that need to be taken. And those steps are the return to the rule of law. And I would ask, do you feel this message is being adequately conveyed at this moment to the government in Pakistan? 
I was hoping you wouldn't ask me a question, Congressman, because I thought your statement was so good. I just hope they're listening to it. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and the, the follow-up that, I would, uh, that I, I'd also ask is uh, recently there were some very troubling reports, and this is on a different subject, but uh, Pakistani troops uh, were surrounded and surrendered uh, to militants in uh, some of the same travel areas that I visited there. And I wonder about the preparedness out in that area. When I, when I met with troops there, um, there was a feeling on their part that they were outgunned by the militants. There was also a request that we do something on another subject, and that is the funding that comes into the madrasas that train the next generation of young men that go out and commit suicide bombing or, or other attacks, and the fact that so much of that money comes from the Gulf states. And so um, um, I, I would just like to ask you, are we doing all we can do to cut off that flow of money from the Gulf states, from Saudi Arabia and other countries, and whether the security effort that's going on right now against civil society is distracting from the effort against the militants, the jihadists, as we saw this week in terms of this, uh, uh, this report that Pakistani troops had uh, surrendered. I, I think there's no question that the current political events are a distraction. There's no denying that. Um, and if that were to go on for a prolonged period of time, I think it could have uh, an effect of seriously undermining the security efforts uh, in, in the border regions. In addition to that, as you, I think, correctly note, there have been some serious security problems up in the tribal areas due to intensified efforts by the Taliban and other extremists. And I think so far, the, the, the record uh, uh, in containing that activity and bringing it under control has been mixed. I mean, we must recognize that the Pakistani military have transferred many thousands of people up into that northwest frontier area and away from the Indian border. But uh, this, the situation remains challenging, and it's an area that we want to, uh, to uh, intensify our cooperation with the Pakistani government on. For example, by supporting their development plan for the Fatah area, but also by trying to find ways uh, that we can uh, support uh, increased effectiveness of their security forces, whether through uh, military support uh, in, increased intelligence cooperation and so forth. On the uh, funding um, and the flow of funds from the Gulf areas, I guess in a general way, I, I, I confess to not having looked into this specific issue prior to coming up to the hearing, but in a general way what I think I could uh, uh, safely answer to you is that ever since my time as Director of National Intelligence, I've noticed and I've uh, and have worked on an increased priority to following the money with respect to support for international terrorism. So uh, the, the amount of resources and effort that we dedicate to interrupting the flow of funds to international terrorists has substantially increased over the years, and I think uh, we're becoming increasingly more effective at, at that, although um, it, it's a very challenging problem. Thank you, Ambassador. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sir. Um, Ambassador, let me ask you this. Um, how close are we to civil war in Pakistan? The reason I'm asking that is eerily, we look like a similar situation in Iraq, a strong man, as Saddam Hussein but kept things in order, so to speak. Here in Pakistan, what would be the consequences with the Masharif? Let's say he does step down. Who then controls the military? 
And then secondly, especially what makes this different from, let's say, Iraq in that situation is the fact they have nuclear weapons. So then who controls the nuclear weapons? You've got a volatile situation with uh, the returning from exile of two prime ministers who are very popular, who have uh, legions of followers in and of themselves. We've already had tracks of uh, over 800 assassinations. We've lost 800 lives in recent suicide bombings. Uh, one of these have been targeted at uh, former Prime Minister Bhutta. Uh, we have elements of uh, is, uh, is Islamic radicalism. We have cells of terrorism which already have been identified. And probably the strongest country on earth with influence of Al Qaeda is Pakistan. So if you could, within that purview, answer the question, do you fear civil war? Could it not break out? If so, what does that pretend with a country with at atomic and nuclear weapons? And in the order of business within Pakistan, if Musharraf does resign and steps down as head of the military, who then takes his place? And is that person one who controls the nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I Congressman, I honestly believe that, um, well, first of all, stability in Pakistan is important. And, but as this discussion this afternoon has uh, uh, demonstrated, we all feel that it's stability, but in the context of uh, forward movement mm -hmm. uh, on the democracy agenda. And in fact, we think, we believe, the United States believes that uh, it's through democracy that you're pr most likely to achieve enduring stability in that country. And as you mentioned, the ingredients for instability uh, are there. Uh, and uh, that's a cause for concern. But I think civil war, or the prospect of civil war, is, is a very strong term. And I, I, don't, I don't think uh, 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 that, that that would um, apply to uh, any uh, foreseeable uh, scenario mm -hmm. in Pakistan. But the very fact that you raise that term and raise that concern, it seems to me, it just serves to reemphasize the importance of getting this constitutional process back on track. And that's what we're so keen on, on achieving. Now, you asked me uh, when uh, President Musharraf takes his uh, uniform off, uh, who will take his place? Well, actually, the the Pakistani uh, military is a is a pretty well organized institution, mm -hmm. and they have a they have succession planning there. And uh, the um, individual who just became uh, a vice chief of the army, uh, I believe, is the individual who would most likely then be moved up to becoming chief of the army, which is the position that. Chief of Staff of the Army, which is the position that Musharraf occupies. So I think there's a there's plenty of succession planning that's gone on in the Pakistani military, and I believe also that they have their nuclear weapons under effective control. By that control, you mean does it come political control or military? No, control? I mean effective technical control. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean they're not sloppy about that. With the former Prime Minister Bhutta. Uh, what 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 are the possibilities of a of a joint sharing of power? Well, in a way, that's what some of the dialogue between them, uh, directly and indirectly, has been about in recent months. And uh, I think that it's uh, the issue is that they need to find some kind of understanding that permits uh, both of them to make a contribution. There's room for both in the political process to help the country move forward politically, and I think that that's the kind of dialogue that needs to be encouraged. In the international... The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tancredo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, to what extent do um, any of the primary uh, opposition candidates that appear on the scene, either Mr. Sharif or Ms. Buddha, what, to what extent do they actually enjoy any popularity w within the country, uh, considering especially 
the fact that both of them left the country, I mean, certainly under dubious circumstances, but under charges of corruption and whatever, I guess one way, another way of putting it is, do you believe those charges were true originally? Do you think that we can enjoy, we can anticipate anything better should there become some sort of power sharing arrangement? And I guess just to what extent do they, as I say, have any political cachet within the government, within the country itself? Well, of course, the best measure of that, or one of the measures of that would be how many of their people they can get elected to the legislature. And they did have legislative elections in 2002. And some of the supporters of these political players were elected to the Pakistani legislature. So, and I think there's a, they each have a reservoir of political support in Pakistan. How effective they would be if either one were to come to power, I don't know. That would be just purely speculation on my part. But I don't have any doubt in my mind that they enjoy a certain amount of political support, which would obviously have to be tested by the electoral process. So you think that the corruption challenge, or the corruption charges that were originally brought anyway, and brought to light, are not significant anymore? I honestly don't know. To what extent do you believe that the cooperation that we have received on various fronts, and that has been thoroughly discussed to a large extent here today, to what extent do you believe that that cooperation is coming about as a result of his desire, Musharraf's desire to, of course, retain the economic opportunities that we provide for, the economic advantages we provide for him, but also just in terms of, is it just doing what's barely necessary, is what I'm trying to figure out here. Is he just doing the minimum? And where does his heart really lie, to the best of your knowledge? Well, first of all, I believe that the government of Pakistan, including President Musharraf, act out of their perception and their definition of their own national interest. I have no doubt about that. Secondly, I believe that since 9-11, particularly the major speech that President Musharraf gave with regard to the war on terror, I believe it was in November of 2001, I think since that time, he has basically said he wants to work with us in dealing with this problem. And I think that he has been doing that, and his security forces have been doing that to the best of their ability. I don't think it's being done for the purpose of obtaining this or that kind of foreign assistance. I think it's done in pursuit of the interests of their country as they see them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no other questions. Gentlelady from California, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the ambassador for the amount of time you have spent patiently addressing our concerns. One of my concerns is I don't understand our policy. Musharraf had vowed to resign his military commission following re-election, but he will become even more politically vulnerable as a civilian president. And he's not expected to doff his army uniform until his election is confirmed. And the Bush administration is quietly encouraging such an arrangement as both sustaining Musharraf's role and of strengthening moderate political forces in Islamabad. Well, it seems to me that the fugitive we were looking for after 9-11, al-Qaeda founder Osama bin Laden and his top executive, 
al-Sawari are widely believed to be in western Pakistan. In all these years that we have centered the war on terror in Iraq, where we have lost thousands of our people and spent millions of dollars, and here we have this crisis, and we're hoping that this one person will be able to assist us in finding the real enemy. So my question to you, Ambassador, is what is our policy? Is he the only one? Is he indispensable? And I think my colleague, Sheila Jackson Lee, pointed to one way to deal with this, put an envoy coalition together of uh, people and uh, try to give a bottom line that, you know, if we're going to continue to pump millions of dollars in and expect you to go in and find our enemy, the real enemy, as so was said, Osama bin Laden, then you've got to give up the uniform and be president or have free elections and take the consequences. I don't understand what we are doing and why are we spending all this time trying to figure out their problems and we have all our men and resources and women over in Iraq. Can mm -hmm. you explain? Well, um, first of all, you raised the issue of, of uh, indispensability. And, and I think, as I said earlier, I think sometimes we fall into a trap here and we start talking about one individual as a symbol of the leadership of the whole country. And certainly we're grateful for the role that President Musharraf has played. And he's played an extremely important role, as I was discussing earlier. but. Our support is for the government and the people of Pakistan. It's for uh, the security forces. It's for the army Excuse of Pakistan. Excuse me. We understand that. Yeah. But why is it you are not trying to identify someone else? Or shall we go around, Mashari, well, and think send it's... money, hold on, send no. money into a third party? I can't figure out exactly what we're doing. We're trying to encourage. Has it done any good in all these years? Oh, no. Have their forces been able to find, has intelligence been given to us where we could go in and find our real enemy? And, you know, we might be powerful, but we certainly are not influential there or in the world today. So trying to encourage has not done any good. So what is the policy going to be? How long are we going to play this game? Well, and why are we still over in Iraq if this is the center, if we think this is where the real enemy is located? Well, first of all, I think we're fighting this fight on several fronts. Oh, uh, okay. But I wouldn't pronounce I'll this, buy that. I, I, I wouldn't pronounce this policy uh, a failure. We're trying to encourage this. Let's see what happens. I think we're all very, we're very eager to see long these measures wait? rolled back. Well, uh, before they have to face some consequences. How uh, long do we have to say to American people, you have to continue to give your sons and daughters and your taxpayers money? I think to the Iraq. Yeah, but the longer this situation goes on in Pakistan in its present form, I think the more difficult the situation will become in Pakistan itself. And I don't think it's for us necessarily to determine the consequences. Who, I think the political actors in Pakistan themselves uh, will have something to say about that. Then why do we keep pumping? The gentleman's time has expired. <clears throat> gentleman from Washington, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being here. I mean, obviously, our primary policy goal in Pakistan region at this point is to help them and as much as we can ourselves contain al-Qaeda and the Taliban and there are many, many impediments for getting there. Um, I think having broader support of the Pakistani people for their government certainly would be one. It sort of undermines Musharraf's authority. And I think, well, the question I have is to get your opinion on whether or not, you know, in any way that we can. And, I, and I'm sympathetic to the notion that we have a limited ability to simply force Musharraf or anybody in Pakistan to do whatever we want. I think that's, you know, one of our, our approach, 
some of the criticism of Pakistan policy has focused on that, and I think that's a mistake, because one of the things that, that makes Pakistan very angry at us is the notion that you know, they are our puppet to do our will. When I visited Pakistan more than once, they made the point that, you know, don't forget, we represent Pakistan. You know, your interests are nice, um, but they're not ours, and you guys seem to forget that with great frequency and try to jam it down our throat, and that creates less cooperation, not more. So all the talk about cutting off aid, doing all these other things to force them. I mean, I understand the desire, but the result is it pushes many Pakistanis further away from us. But the question is, if there was greater democracy in Pakistan, if there was greater freedom, you know, we draw the comparison, you can push democracy in some places and wind up in a worse situation. Certainly the, the feeling is that's what happened uh, in, the pal in Palestine. Um, but here it seems like if there was greater democracy, you would have that you know, Pakistani middle class more supportive of their government, which would strengthen their hand to deal with those who are sympathetic to the Taliban. Do, do you agree with that, as opposed to the notion of we just got to back Musharraf and make him as strong as possible, regardless of the impact on the democratic issues? I, I, I think I would agree with the proposition that uh, some understanding uh, between the Pakistani military and civic society about how to go forward at an electoral political process uh, moving towards greater democracy, these would be um, helpful in dealing with uh, the different challenges that Pakistan faces, including extremism. I think it'd be a positive thing. And it strikes me that that ought to be our policy, and it also strikes me that we really need to back off a little bit on all of the threats and all of the. And I'm not saying you; I'm talking about us. As back much as off I, of what? Uh, of all of the threats. You know, don't do this. We're going to cut off your money. We gave you 10 billion dollars in the last five years. What have we got for it? Um, I mean, I understand the sentiment where that is coming from, but somewhere from our government has to be the statement of what you said earlier in answer to Ms. Watson's. The question, we're, we're with the Pakistani people, and we have a long-term commitment to that region. Right. We understand that you need our help, and we're not just going to yank it on a whim um, or when we feel like it. Because in Pakistan, they very much believe that we are simply using them and we'll discard them again at a moment's notice. And that undermines the ability to get the broad-based support within Pakistan to, to take on the Taliban. Because their answer is, hey, the Taliban's going to be here forever. You guys, you kind of come and go. So we need to make that, that longer-term commitment, but I think part of that has to be a commitment to all of the Pakistani people and not just to Musharraf um, in terms of how we approach that. Um, last question. The, um, as I understand it, most of the people in Pakistan don't vote. Um, it's actually a relatively small percentage of the pop, well, 33 percent to 40 percent, and there's a lot of other folks who don't. How, how do you judge how they view what's going on with Musharraf? You have the the, the rioting lawyers, if you will, um, in the middle class who are upset about that. And then you have the, the, the vast majority of Pakistanis who are you know, more in poverty. How are they viewing the situation, both in terms of their, their feelings about Musharraf and their sympathies for al-Qaeda and the Taliban? I, I, I don't, I, I'm not certain, uh, I, but, but uh, <laughs> I'm clear on that point, I'm mean, your opinion. <laughs> I really am not. I, I put, put some polling data in my my statement, I, I do think that most uh, uh, Pakistanis are, are moderate and they don't favor extremism. I suspect that once you get out of the more urbanized uh, areas that people are probably not as intensely interested uh, in uh, uh, politics as they might be in the capital and in the major cities, and that um, political activity of that kind, legislation, uh, elections, and so forth, is probably uh, um, of limited interest to uh, uh, many uh, average Pakistanis. Probably most, I would, I would guess. You know, I just I wouldn't know what number to attach to that, but that, I think most people right. want to get on with their lives. They want to uh, live a better life, and... Uh, that's where the economic piece comes in. Uh, that's where, where the our, economic our support one? can't... Right, and that's where Thank stability you. comes in, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Never before have lawyers been so popular. Shakespeare must be turning over in his grave. <laughs> um, one question we have is, do we have a Pakistan policy or do we have a Musharraf policy? Um, let me 
ask a specific hypothetical. What if Musharraf imprisons Bhutto? Is it clear that at that point we would cut off aid? Your, your first question, do we have a Musharraf policy or do we have a Pakistan policy? I think uh, the answer to that is we have a Pakistan policy. I, that, that was a rhetorical question right, because I, I knew understand. what the answer would be. Now, um, what do we do? The other if, one is a hypothetical that um, I think raises a, uh, uh, a prospect that, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, would be uh, would create a, a, an extraordinarily dramatic political situation in that country. The hardly, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, there were no well, UFOs in that question. You want, that you was, want my answer to the hypothetical? I don't, I, I just, uh, I, I'm reluctant to do that. Let me phrase I, it But this. I think it's a very, it's a worst case hypothesis. It's hardly worst case. I mean, Bhutto has, in effect, said that there are elements in the Musharraf government who are responsible for the attempt on her life. Um, it see, doesn't seem unlikely uh, or extreme. It certainly doesn't seem uh, beyond discussion that uh, uh, Musharraf would imprison her at this mm -hmm. time. Um, uh, one concern I have, Mr. Chairman, is how we are going to um, advocate democracy in Pakistan when there has been so little rule of law and democracy in the area of foreign policy uh, here in the United States. Uh, you can't think about Pakistan without thinking of how our committee was treated on the F-16 issue and how other cabinet members, not Mr. Neg Neg or Ambassador Negroponte, have in effect testified before Congress that not even the procedural aspects of the Iran Sanctions Act will be followed because the administration doesn't think that laws are uh, binding. Um, I should give you a chance uh, to comment. I realize that's a little bit outside the scope of these hearings, but uh, can you give a reason why uh, the administration regards the Iran Sanctions Act as uh, uh, merely the act of a, 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 a a, co a consultative body rather than a legislative body. I, I'm afraid, Congressman, I... I'm well, you do know there's an Iran Sanctions Act. You do know you're supposed to at least identify those corporations investing more than $20 million in the Iran oil sector. You do know the State Department has simply refused to do for, for six years uh, or seven years throughout the term of this administration. You do know that's a violation of law. and. The idea that the rule of law is something we're going to preach in Pakistan is a little difficult under all right. the circumstances. I, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm sure you'll understand that I didn't come prepared to answer that question. Well, I would hope I, you would furnish an answer I, for the record. I will certainly do that. Has, uh, has my time expired, or do I still have You it? have about a minute and 18 seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, have we, if we have a policy for the Pakistan people, why have we provided uh, not so much economic aid, not so much aid to help the fight against al-Qaeda, where in the northwest uh, frontier provinces the Pakistani forces are still have both action rifles, but why have such, why is such a significant portion of the aid been of the military devices that will be useful to the army of Pakistan in confronting India or another uh, conventional force. Uh, why the F what do the F-16s do either for the war against terror or uh, to raise living standards among the Pakistani people? Right. Uh, Congressman, I, well, first of all, uh, with respect to security assistance uh, of various kinds, which is admittedly a, a, a substantial part of the assistance, but we have also given and are giving, and would like to continue giving, uh, a considerable economic and social and development assistance. But as the well. military aid is the lion. The gentleman's sheet. time has expired, so I will not take any additional questions. But but I, I just would, if I may, conclude. just a very in a couple of sentences. I, I think if you look at the actual 
breakdown, and I have the whole breakdown here for the, since fiscal year 2002 right through 2008, I think you'll find that it's a blend of assistance that touches on, on all areas, and, and I think uh, quite a logical uh, arrangement of, uh, of assistance, and uh, I think uh, touching on all of our interests in Pakistan. Mr. Ambassador, I know I speak for every member of the committee in expressing our deep appreciation to you. You have been patient with a very lively, knowledgeable, and articulate crowd, yes. and we are, we are most grateful to you. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Sure.